Now we have the context group. So we did life cycle assessment, and under the definition of narration, uh, we said ability to utilize the embedded data to evaluate design uh, decisions slash alternative systems. Advise during the design phase, resource availability regarding constructability, safety, and sequencing. Preferences was to the CMA standard of practice and standard contracts and TCM. What's TCM? Uh, I don't remember TCM. Yeah. Well, we won't worry about that. Part. We'll strike it from the record. Okay, use case. Uh, MEP contractor presents alternative system solutions which need to be sized and evaluated based upon the developed model. Information from the model is used to inform the evaluation process to establish the cost and design implication of each alternative. And then the major role performance thing, ability to query the application data from the model, ability to communicate the data with two, uh, ability to communicate the data to the project stakeholders, and the assessment matrix, we said had impact on performance of the project, uh, delays, errors, emissions, tracking, uh, model-based systems, assessment report, and organized model information assessment. On that. Okay. Any um, comments and uh, any reflections and immediately catch your attention, catch your attention. You want to have a discussion now? No? Yeah, to the cost of ownership. Uh, life cycle assessment. Okay. No, That's TCO. Oh. Total cost of ownership. TCO. 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 Yeah, that's the total cost, man. Yeah. Okay. Why did that add in? Thank you. Okay. You? Yeah. Great. I'm new in here, so I have uh, five minutes for, for not for asking this. Um, there's a, in, in typical projects, you would have policies and procedures. And I did not see anything regarding policies and procedures in as far as I went through the material in here, which defines a lot of the things that are being discussed. In. Mm -hmm. So where would that fit in the whole scenario? Talk about policies and uh, policies and procedures. Procedures that are uh, for standards of practice for the project itself. You talk about project execution or no, just the okay the yeah, general which process. Covers everything that you're trying to put in here, whether it's human resources, uh, whether it's equipment, whether it's finance, whether it's uh, uh, life cycle costing, is all covered under uh, policies and procedures. Well, it sounds like that might be advanced knowledge that you might need for each of these some of these different categories. Is Combined. Your entry level would be maybe not understanding the technology, but your advanced level would be understanding the policy, the procedure that shapes and forms the workflow or the needs. Because under the policies and procedures, you set guidelines, for example, on what constructability is. It provides you all that information. What do we look for in constructability? Uh, value engineering, value management will give you guidance on how you manage that. Uh, contractual documents, what are the procedures that you follow to get your documents in, in, in the right way. Um, and so you, the list goes on and on and on. Right, you are, you are from the programming management, project management at a very top level, basically. That's the other thing that's not mentioned in here, which is program management. And I think that it, it needs to be inclusive in the discussion. Well, I think it needs to, right, there's project management body of knowledge, and so we need to know how the VIM body of knowledge perhaps Differentiating. Or, yeah, or is connected to or reflects it. Or, right. right. So we don't want to reinvent right. all of construction project management. Here. Exactly. We exactly. just need to understand mm -hmm. the interface. And I think one of the interfaces, and in, in the way that we talked about it, was at, you know, that the, 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 there's an expert level term you had the spark category. Full performance level, yeah. Full performance level would be knowledge of policy procedure and the intersection between technology and policy and workflow. Right? So mm -hmm. to me 
that is a skill that an expert has, is understanding the whole process and the procedures there. Not that they that would, I agree with And then how to apply it, right? Whereas um, the more entry level person, they may know the technology, they may know a certain workflow, but they don't necessarily know how it feeds in or contributes or have only a sense of, of that. You know. They all teach value in our classes, but it's not a full, they don't get a full understanding of project management. Well, we have a lot of product management that we don't give them the full foundation of what economics. We have a whole section called manager. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, we do, but it's just the beginning of what economics. They don't come out of our programs as experts, right? They come out of essentially other people, and you have to add to that. So. And part of it would be embedded, wouldn't it, in the organization? the policies and procedures of the organization. So that would be on a case-by-case -case application, even at the entry level. But they would, they would learn their organization's policy and procedures would be their guide, their internal guide, right? Would that be reasonable? Yeah, organizational behavior. Uh, every company has their proprietary practices that they become very competitive. So establishing framework for that, you know, everybody picks and chooses. And we know that there are some unethical people out there in the world as well to break some of those. So the idea behind establishing the level of competencies you should know, and that's all part of the certification processes, ethics, all that. So it is organizational behavior that establishes that. You as a company, proprietor, you're gonna set the rules. Sometimes you skirt those rules. Well, maybe what you're suggesting is this has to add another category. Uh, I think so. Yeah. As it relates to I think so. That's why I'm myself. So we're saying that we're going to add another care, um, level for implementation, or which are you specifically talking about? Add another category. Saying add another category, talk about specifically policies and procedures in order to implement it being at both organizational or project specific levels. Was that what you're I referring to? That of, so, so uh, in, a, in a project in general, the policies and procedures will give you guidance on how you implement every aspect of the project, whether it's scheduling, estimating, everything else. Right. So, so everyone will follow these, these guidelines, and so that all the individuals involved will understand how, how things will work within the project. I would think that's very generic. It's yeah. just like any boilerplate language in place. Yes. And each project team, they have their best practices there. Yeah. As long as they comply with the procedure, the policies, the actual you know, plan they carry out, the actual practice they're gonna you know, use is gonna be based upon their best performances and best practices, I believe. But, but I think that's one of the things we discussed from an actor was the, the, some of the cases, especially a use case, needed a business process. Yes. And in fact, Penn State has identified 25 BIM use, BIM use process and, models and have, have mm -hmm. process models because we are asking people to change the way they do business. So there is a new business process that they have to move to in order to take advantage of these, of BIM, I guess in general. Mm -hmm. So should we just continue with this conversation going, continue to the FM group there, Carrie, sure. uh, since you were already there, so I just thought right. with you. All right, I've been volunteered. So our, our group, in summary, found that there were two types of line items. One line item seemed to be aligned with BIM uses, the concept of how we use the tool for a particular process. Um, the life cycle assessment being one, and the pre-construction issues being the second. The other two model, their validation and aggregated models seem to be BIM skills that would feed or be used in several BIM uses. And so we actually came up with this notion that there was actually a matrix perhaps of BIM uses across the top and BIM skills across, across a down, down, down column. And you could identify <clears throat> for any BIM use a particular set of BIM skills that would be needed to implement those workflows. So that was the big thing that came out of our, mm -hmm. our group. Uh, from the owner
consumer's perspective, when we got to life cycle analysis, we actually took it to be life cycle asset planning because that's when owners are trying to set up budgets to manage and maintain their facilities. However, the, the more strict definition of life cycle assessment is more around carbon footprint calculations, right? So our team ended up talking a lot about asset management, but not LCA. So we interpreted it a bit differently. And there are many issues here. This, this falls under the more general term bid for FM, and there's a lot going on in that space right now that I don't think I'll unpack at this moment. Uh, what we found to be useful was to think about entry level, mid level, and expert. We thought that was probably the highest value category coming out of each of these analysis. That as someone's trying to sit down and either assemble a team for a work uh, for a project and identify what are the skills we need uh, for this project, that, that would be very useful to have. Okay, we want these three BIM uses. We need these three. We need these BIM skills. And what levels of expertise do we need? We want to make sure we have someone who understands it at an expert level and the people to execute it at perhaps the entry level and mid level. So for life cycle assessment, we felt the le entry level was, uh, was uh, understanding what is native in a model that's perhaps coming out of a design construction process that can be used for either LCA for formally or asset management generally. So what kinds of, uh, without a COBE spec, without an asset data specification, what kinds of information are found in these models that are typically used today and could be extracted? At the mid-level, thinking about, um, about trying to use the geometries in the operational side, uh, it says Revit, not CAD, so how do we move our owners into a BIM-based platform? Uh, but I think at the expert level, what we think is going to happen is there'll actually be relationships between CAD and GIS, and that GIS may be, uh, GIS, isn't going, GIS isn't going away, in fact, there may be a blending between them and GIS at some point as they're both cloud based systems. Um, so I, we, I don't think we followed the assignment very well. <laughs> we kind of went off on our own, what we thought was important. Um, pre <laughs> Pre-construction issue resolution, uh, we were a little bit more disciplined in this category. Um, we found that there were two things that go under here. One is the communication through visualization. So one of the things that we've studied, that we've seen um, in pre-con discussions is the power of visualization of these tools. Um, and the inclusion of all parties and stakeholder engagement. Right? That's what we're doing, both through visualization of the geometry, but also visualization data, right, able to represent the analysis in visual ways. Uh, so some use cases that, that we brainstormed include energy modeling and clash detection, but that's a very short list of a very long possible list. Um, so things that may be measured, um, there's a performance measurement that, that I am championing right now, which is the shared understanding of problems and solutions. So how do you get a shared understanding across a stakeholder group with what if we're talking about an issue in design, what is that issue? Does everyone understand the constraints and opportunities represented by that issue? And then, let's see. So our spectrum here was at entry level, one would be able to create visualizations, right? At the mid level, that, um, that there's some initial under phases of understanding the team roles and the team dynamics and how to, how to, do, how to navigate designers and owners and, and end users and how to work with all these different types. And at the advanced level, I think one of the expert skills is that they're able to anticipate issues, or rather anticipate the frame of the decision makers. Is the owner budget oriented? Are they design oriented? Are they, or is it all about schedule? If you're billing for Intel, you could bill as fast as humanly possible, if not more so. Um, right, so there's certain lenses that you have to prepare yourself to address in the design process and the, the advanced user knows their audience and knows how to tailor their content to that audience. All right, so that those were our two BIM uses that we identified. So BIM uh, skills, uh, model uh, validation. This is where we really found that this was the BIM skill because we can think of 10 different model uses estimating 
record modeling where you would use record model validation. So um, you might use record modeling, you might use point cloud uh, to validate uh, geometry, uh, walking the field to validate information. Um, so what we said as a general definition for this BIM skill is that it's uh, adaptable to accuracy depending on use and purpose and goodness of fit. So it's, a, it's the process of ass assessing the goodness of fit that model for that use. Um, let's see. There's two things to measure here, both the geometric information as well as the non-geometric information. Asset data sometimes is called. And what really needs to be done in the assessment is the end user requirement. intelligently interrogate specific disciplinary models mm -hmm. and actually find your trying to look for Yeah. Yeah. Model literacy. Smart yeah. yeah. Great. Great. Okay. Thank you. 
right?